Hey guys, welcome back to the Blue Deck Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Mazrak. Giving you a heads up, next week is my birthday, so I'm taking a week off from podcasting. Happy birthday, me! But fear not, we will return with more adventure, and guess what, guys? Charles and his friends are about to find themselves in the attic of the world. Frankly, that's not going to go very well for our good friend Charles Miller, but we'll get to that soon enough. Now, I just want to take a moment to say hello to our new listeners. Always interesting to see where people are listening. Hello, Mexico. Hello, Czech Republic. I see we have lots of new listeners in Washington State and Michigan. One interesting bit of trivia for you Washington listeners. Your state is where this story was born. That's right. Well, the kids in the story are from Florida, where I'm from. Captain Kidd was inspired by a boy I met at a marina in Washington, 2014, on the 4th of July. You probably didn't know that. Maybe you'll hear more about that on one of our off-season shows. Okay, I'm anxious to get to the next chapter, so let's have a recap and get to it. Take it away, Layla. All the kids get busy, prepping the shuttle for liftoff. Charles assists Captain Kidd, measuring things like wind speed and barometric pressure. Later, as Captain Kidd uses a spyglass to search for the upward-facing door, William brings Coax to the top of the launch tower. While the captain's search continues, Charles and his best friend drink their sodas in quiet reflection. But once the doorway is located... William trades his last Coca-Cola for a turn on the telescope. Promptly, he finds the magic door, which he describes as a cross between a blimp and a space station. Intrigued, Charles looks through the scope but cannot focus on the flying blur in the sky. Giving up, he passes the telescope back to Captain Kidd. Having all the data needed for the flight calculations, the captain leads them back into the shuttle where he has another surprise in store. Each crew member will have a critical role aboard the Nautilus. Charles will be the first mate. Don will be the electrotechnical officer. William, chief engineer, and Nazi, the assistant engineer. The only one aboard who remains merely a passenger is Joseph the Crab in his travel-sized aquarium. The chapter concludes with Charles monitoring the rocket's temperatures, still in the red, but climbing. Chapter 12, Going Up I watched the temperature rise, half convinced that if the mercury climbed into the white, the rockets would detonate on the platform as rockets are prone to do. But Captain Kidd didn't appear worried. Zone 3 on Rocket B has reached peak temperature, I reported. Good. The captain looked to his left. Mr. Gazick, open the circuitry valves. Let's see if we can get those temps to even out. William looked surprised to hear himself referred to as Mr., but then found a series of gauges corresponding to rocket temperatures. He had a gauge for each layer within the rockets, not just the three major temperature zones, and yet, at his panel, he found no way to affect them. He leaned to his left, studying Ozzy's instruments. Looks like you've got to open those valves, he pointed. I think they correspond to my readouts. Ozzy twisted open a stacked series of notch handles similar to outdoor water spigots. The captain said, When the dynamite is expended in a section of rocket, close the valve and pull the lever next to it. That will jettison the can. How will I know when it's spent? Ozzy asked. 
A good question. We almost see the warning light blow his gauge. Captain Kidd turned to Don. Monitor those voltage meters. If there's no power, the fuse burned out. Replace it immediately. She looked around her seat. The captain pointed. The spares are in the box below your chair. She reached between her feet and brought out a shoe box with a Nike swoosh pitted across the side. The box was definitely not from the 1930s. Men's size ten and a half, she read. She opened the lid to find a pair of pliers and fuses the size of poker decks. What can I do? I asked. Captain Kidd eyed me sidelong. You'll be in charge of docking, but I tell you, pull that lever and pedal as fast as you can to extend the boom. You'll use the joysticks to aim. My control module stood on a squared-off pedestal. On each side of the pedestal were bicycle pedals. I hadn't noticed those before. If I scooted my chair all the way up, I could reach them. The joystick was prominently featured within reach of my right hand. What's the trigger for? I imagined machine guns popping out from hidden hatches in the nose. The captain looked at me seriously. It operates the clamp. One shot only. Use it on my mark or we'll have major problems. Then he faced forward again. If he had any concern at all that I, or any of us for that matter, would clam up under pressure, he showed not a hint of it. His face was serene, his posture relaxed, and if anything, he was ready to be off. His hands went to the T-bar, his clean, youthful fingers adjusting their grip. Chief, if the crew is ready, begin the countdown. I looked at my friends. Yes, this was really happening. Dawn took in a breath, squeezed the shoebox of fuses against her body, and nodded. I leaned back in my chair, looking past the captain to William. William shrugged. I waited, and then he nodded in the affirmative. When I looked to Ozzy, he waved a quick salute. Let's light this candle. We've got a fairy thief to catch. Yeah, William agreed. Like the marshal would say, we're burning daylight. I grinned. They were right. My parents wouldn't understand. Even I didn't. But what we were doing was important, and there was no going back now. I looked at Captain Kidd. We're ready, sir. How long should I set the timer? Eleven seconds. But adjust your seat now if you need to. Won't be able with the thrusters on boost. He was right. Working against gravity, I could hardly pull the seat forward even now. When my feet were on the foot pedals, I thumbed the up arrow on the dash-mounted stopwatch. Eleven seconds, I said. On your mark. I could feel my voice hiccup, but the others were probably too anxious to hear it. The captain's hands tightened on the T-handle, began and count us down. Even in his voice, I could hear energy bubbling over. I pressed the start button. Eleven. Ten. Nine. My voice grew louder with every second lost from the clock. Eight. Seven. Six. My heart was pounding out of my chest. Five. Four. Three strange tingling danced over my skin. Two, one, lift off! The captain cranked the T-bar with all his might. The machinery zinged, and he threw himself back against the seat, his hands moving to the armrest. Brace yourselves! As the words left his mouth, I heard a rumble from the base of the launch pad and felt the tremble throughout the entire ship. The rumble grew into a deafening roar. The Nautilus was vibrating like a paint shaker, us the paint, with a titanic shout of dynamite exploding in the steel confines of rocket tubes. I felt the shove, the thrust from the explosion, push my seat against my back. We're moving, as he cried. Glancing in his direction, I saw the the highest point of the launch tower, the white post, disappearing out of view. Beyond that, the concrete walls of the canyon were a gray blur and then gone. We were past ground level, past the treetops, into the air. Captain Kidd called out, Engineer, what's the status of those rocket temps? And a good thing, too, because William was staring out the window. Below the first two temperature gauges, warning lights glowed in angry orange. William turned to Ozzy, Jettison the first rocket section. Ozzy, already turning, spun the valves closed and yanked the release levers. I could feel the weight fall away. The next lights in the series blinked on and Ozzy released those too. 
to my right, Don threw off the lid of her shoebox, ripped free a burnt fuse from the breaker, and shoved a new one into place. The armrests of Captain Kidd's seat had unfolded to reveal two joysticks similar to mine, but without the triggers. He was using the sticks to control the flight, I assumed, but our mad explosion into the air felt totally out of control. How are those temperatures, Mr. Gazick? Holding steady, William said, 120 degrees except on the burning cans, which are off the scales. Between the flash of warning lights and the ejection of rocket canisters, William and Ozzy worked in tandem. William called out section numbers and temperatures, and Ozzy opened and closed coolant valves to avoid a meltdown. In front of the captain, a glass dial like a free-floating billiard ball spun in its housing. I'm having trouble holding it steady, he said. Charles, how much dynamite's left? The little odometers he cranked over 15,000 pounds were turning with rapidity on their descent back down to zero. Just drop past 1,200, maybe another 20 seconds. To the side of the ship, spent rocket sections, indeed, looking very much like gigantic tuna cans with the lids cut off, fell away, their rims flaming. This time, I not only felt the added lift, but the roar of the rockets was growing louder, the vibrations threatening to tear the ship apart. My teeth chattered so hard they might crack. Another set of rocket sections broke free. I smelled explosive vapor seeping into the cockpit, like gunpowder smoke soured by the fragrance of an industrial chemical factory. Don reset the fried circuits, oily pliers in one end, a handful of fresh fuses, shiny and new in the other. The rockets were almost done, and still I hadn't seen the space station. Were we off course? Had we passed it? No way to know. The rocket fuel odometers tracked the last few hundred pounds of explosives. Chief, the captain's hands gripped the control sticks. When it zeroes out, hit the master release switch. I found the switch beneath the odometers, an intimidating lever as broad as my hand, surrounded by yellow and black checkered warning paint. I seized it, paused for the last second of thrust, and pulled. The crack sounded along the length of the floor, and the remaining rocket sections fell away, including the tall white nose cones. Where they might land on someone's house, for all I knew, was a concern for another day. With the rockets freed, the ship fell into relative silence. Now it was only the rush of wind. However, we were not yet docked, and still I couldn't see the station. The captain spoke through clenched teeth. Start pedaling, Charles. Be quick about it. No need to tell me twice. I rode the pedals as if my life depended on it, and perhaps it did. Strange, jarring resistance communicated through the pedals into the soles of my shoes. I ignored it, cranking the gears with all the strength of my legs. Mechanisms were moving in the floor. I felt them. A moment later, through the curved bank of windows, I saw a peculiar open two-fingered claw extend past the nose of the ship. The thing's talons were shiny and thin like the arcade game claws that drop down to paw at stuffed animals, only this one was big enough to grab a station wagon. As my feet worked the pedals, the reach of the claw lengthened on an extendable arm. Then, past the gleaming curves of the docking claw, I saw at last the target of our trajectory. That's it, guys. Pretty exciting stuff. In the next episode, they'll cross into a whole new world. I wonder how that's going to go. All right. Thanks for listening. Hit me up on Twitter or follow me on Facebook. Links in the description. But more than anything else, tell someone about the show. That really helps a lot. Thanks. See you next time. Okay. Bye.